Hi, it's Dr. Khan with the last two sections of chapter 6, 6.8, and 6.12. We're going to be discussing geologic hazards that are associated with volcanoes and talk about how volcanic activity is tied back into plate tectonics. The first and one of the most destructive types of hazards that are associated with volcanoes are pyroclastic flows. Pyro, again, meaning from fire and clastic, meaning bits or fragments of rocks. So fiery pyroclastic flows made up with superheated gases, uh, enough to just totally incinerate anything in its path, trees, houses, people, um, but also this superheated ash and fiery debris that comes sliding down the slopes of a mountain at high speeds, and sometimes speeds so high that even if you were in a car, you couldn't outrun them. This type of activity, this pyroclastic flow, is what destroyed the ancient city of Pompeii that was Mount Vesuvius. We'll actually see a couple of pictures from that in our presentation today. In image A, these come from your textbook, we see these pyroclastic flows streaming down the sides of these composite volcanoes. Composite volcanoes, remember, have magma that's typically higher in silica and can generate these flows of material down the slopes. In image B, I'm hoping that what you're seeing in the background is it's probably a lot farther away than it looks, but these people are still trying to get out of the path of the pyroclastic flow. It doesn't actually look very hot from this perspective, but again, those gases are enough to have given us that before and after picture that we saw in the beginning of chapter six. In our first lecture, we looked at Mount St. Helens before, and I had commented at the time that the after picture really looks like a totally different planet that's barren and devoid of life because everything essentially in the path of this pyroclastic flow will be burned. In the background of the first image, we see Mount Vesuvius, and there's the cone that produced the eruption that sent that pyroclastic flow all the way down uh, to the shoreline, essentially. So it traveled a great distance, and, and people couldn't get out of its path and tried to seek shelter behind structures. Uh, but ultimately, and very sadly, uh, were frozen in, in place and time and turned into stone in the very positions of shelter that they were trying to take in order to avoid being killed by this flow. Another type of volcanic hazard is a lahar. A lahar is like a flood, but instead of a flood with water, we're having this enormous flood of mud, of like this thicker mud substance that's a lot harder to um, clean up from and is, is very destructive. Lahars have been known to bury entire villages. And it's not the kind of thing you can really dig out or excavate easily from to recover bodies or to dig out your home. Because it is mud, it dries into, into land, essentially. Um, so there's villages that were just totally wiped off the face of the earth, um, buried in this, in this thick mud that dries and hardens. Uh, here in this first picture here, we have a picture of Mount St. Helens and the flow that was associated, the lahar that was uh, associated with that. So we see the path that it took. It typically follows the same paths that our streams would follow down the sides of the mountain. Here is a really great look at Mount St. Helens, how really this whole side of this, this composite volcano was blown off. This picture here, B, is from a different location, but it is showing a picture of a lahar and how it's in the process of, of burying this town. And you have to remember, much like a flood, it's not just the water you have to worry about. There's boulders and stones and trees and things that will help to kind of take apart buildings. We can already see there's extensive damage to these um, structures in addition to being buried. Other volcanic hazards include tsunamis. A tsunami is like a wall of water. Uh, that can happen if a volcanic landform in the ocean collapses that will displace water and create this generate this wave of um, water that can travel at high speeds towards a coastline. Volcanic ash is very dangerous for aviation uh, because it can damage the engines and planes. 
and volcanic gas can also cause respiratory health problems because gases are some of the gases that can be released by a volcano are poisonous also some of that ash that's that you can breathe in if you look at under a microscope you can see that the ash itself oftentimes has very jagged edges so it looks like very small particles once you breathe that in it can actually cut your lungs from the inside a significant amount of ash that's released into the atmosphere can alter global temperatures at least on a short-term scale where we could be blocking sunlight across the globe as that ash cloud travels and spreads across the globe and it has the effect of lowering Earth's temperature because it can block the sunlight. Ash is, is very heavy, particularly when it rains after uh, being distributed across an area. So what we see here is not only is this, uh, are all these buildings covered in ash, again, if it rains, it's going to add to the weight and start collapsing structures that initially had survived the deposit of ash. Lava flows can also destroy homes and roads and structures that are in their path. This happens sometimes in Hawaii, uh, where even though the, the actual explosion of the volcano is not explosive in nature, remember it's very low viscosity, mafic or basaltic magma, so it's going to be runny, uh, but it's not going to present the same set of hazards. Oftentimes, though, you will see lava flowing across a road and then it had the road it has to be rebuilt and repaired and when that lava hardens into stone the last section that we're covering for chapter six again just me it's really kind of a review of the connection between plate tectonics and volcanic activity and it's just a reminder that the where we have this volcanic activity is not random that most volcanoes are located within or near plate boundaries or margins Divergent plate boundaries, interestingly, remember divergent plate boundaries moving apart. These are areas like our mid Atlantic Ocean, right? That mid ocean ridge um, where we're moving apart and new magma is rising up from the surface and solidifying, uh, rising up from the mantle, solidifying at the surface and pushing apart the plates to form that divergent boundary. So, interestingly, most volume of lava that's erupted is actually happening at those divergent plate boundaries for a couple of reasons. First of all, because they're like seams that run through the earth. There are a lot of divergent plate boundaries uh, that cover an extensive area. And then our convergent boundaries, specifically with subduction, where ocean plate is subducting under either a continental plate or subducting underneath another ocean plate, um, results typically in more explosive volcanism, especially if we have an ocean plate that's subducting underneath continent because that means we're melting our continental crust and forming a more felsic type of explosive magma. Sometimes within a plate, we have volcanic activity. That's called intra, intra meaning within plate volcanism. There are some areas of the mantle where we have this plume of heat and this is called a hot spot. So we have a lot of volcanic activity in these locations because of some irregular kind of hot location of the mantle underneath it. If this hot spot's in the ocean, it produces basaltic magma. And the classic example of hot spot volcanism is Hawaii. But sometimes the hot spot is actually underneath a continent. So the crust that it's going to melt isn't the basaltic crust. It's melting our continental crust over that hot spot, and we end up getting more explosive eruptions. The classic example of that granitic magma from a hot spot that's melting continental crust would be Yellowstone. Yellowstone in the western part of the United States has erupted several times over the past several million years, and they're extreme. In the past, they have been extremely large volumes of magma that's uh, erupted and impacted a very large area in terms of deposits of ash and gas and dust. Yellowstone is often referred to as a supervolcano because of its explosive potential. This is a really great smart figure and again I recommend that you 
take some time to look at what it is that this smart figure is showing you and then go through that that link this slide really just sums up all of the different types of plate interactions or intraplate uh, volcanism and classic examples that you might be asked about for example the mid-atlantic ridge here that divergent plate boundary we have rising magma a rift valley as the uh, plates are moving apart from each other new crust is being formed this slide really ties together not only the material from chapter six but also uh, the material that we covered in plate tectonics in chapter four chapter three rocks and even back to chapter two minerals where we're talking about more felsic versus mafic minerals as well so some students find chapter six a little bit challenging in terms of the amount of content that's assessed because it's really tying together a lot of vocabulary concepts uh, for multiple chapters.